Hi, I'm Mike Boardman from Pacific University in Oregon. I'm really happy to be talking to you today about Newton's method, which is a calculus way to estimate zeros of functions. What we're gonna do today is uh, talk about why we'd be interested in estimating zeros. After that, we'll look at the computations involved in Newton's method. Then we'll look at several examples. We'll take a look at what can go wrong with Newton's method and finally, we're gonna see that there's a connection of Newton's method to chaos and some fractals. So first, let's talk about why we would care about estimating zeros. Well, one way, uh, one thing that you've had to do in your calculus classes and your algebra classes is to solve equations such as the one you see on the screen, x to the fourth minus three x cubed plus two x squared equals x squared minus two. Now, how you would solve that with your graphing calculator at this point is you would graph the function whose expression is on the left side of that equation. And then you would graph the expression on the right side of the equation. And you'd look for the point of intersection between those two graphs. When we find that point of intersection, what we note is that the X value is 1.2882 approximately. Now, another way to solve this equation is to put everything on one side of the equation. So instead of writing two polynomial expressions equal to each other, what we have is one single polynomial expression equal to zero. So solving this equation is going to be equivalent to solving the equation on the left, but solving the equation on the right is really finding a zero. In other words, finding X values that make this expression produce zero. So if we can find zeros of functions, then what that gives us the ability to do is to solve more complicated equations that are not written as one function equals zero. Another reason we might be interested in estimating zeros is to estimate famous numbers. For example, we might wanna estimate the positive number whose square is two. Well, you all know that that number is a root or a solution to the equation x squared minus two equals zero. Of course, the easy way to solve this equation is put the two on the right and take the square root of both sides, remembering that we're looking for a positive or negative square root two when we take the square root of both sides. But we were after estimating the positive number whose square is two. So what we're gonna be doing is looking for an estimate of the point right here on the graph of that parabola. We know that it's exactly square root two, the X coordinate, but we're really after what is the square root of two as a decimal. Another famous number we might be interested in is the number that gives the area of a circle of radius one. You know that that's the number pi. Well, how can we estimate pi? What we know is that pi is a zero of the sine function. So if we look at the graph of the sine function near three, three and a half, we know that somewhere in between there is the point pi comma zero. So if we can estimate this point in a decimal fashion, then what we're gonna have is an estimate for the number pi. So what's our idea here to estimate the zeros of a function? Well, the idea is to use linear functions as estimators on our complicated functions. Throughout calculus, you use the idea of local linearity. You use the idea of tangent lines to help approximate functions that are more complicated. So we use that idea here to also estimate zeros. What we're gonna do is we are going to look at a tangent line to the curve at a particular point because that tangent line looks very much like our function. Here's the graph of the sine function on the interval from one and a half to two and a half. What we note near x equal two is that if we take the tangent line at x equal two, the tangent line looks an awful lot like the curve. If we zoom out a little bit, you'll notice that the curve sort of moves away from the tangent line, or if you like, the tangent line moves away from the curve. But still, if we go a little bit further out, what we notice is that the tangent line eventually hits zero. And so maybe using the tangent line to find out where it hits zero gives us a way to approximate where this curve hits zero. And in fact, that's gonna be our method. 
Now, this particular estimate, starting at x equal two and looking at where the tangent line hits the, the uh, x-axis, does not produce a particularly good estimate of pi. We all know that pi is somewhere around 3.14, and this estimate is 4.185. That's pretty bad, but I bet we can do better. And here's the idea of Newton's method. What we're going to do is not just follow that one tangent line, but we're going to follow multiple tangent lines. So let's take a look at what happens here. If we start with a, an estimate of pi by saying we'll start at 2, that's our initial guess of what pi is. Now, we know that's not very close, but let's just start there. We go up to the curve, and we draw the tangent line and follow it down to 0, and we get our new estimate of where the sine function crosses 0. The power is to repeat that process from where we are right now. In other words, let's go down to the curve and ride the tangent line there back up to the x-axis. Now we have a new estimate of where the original sine curve crosses the x-axis. It's still not great, but it's better than our original estimate. And in fact, it's better than this point over here on the right. We can repeat this again. And when we repeat it that third time, now we're quite a bit closer to the uh, zero of the sine function here. We can repeat again, and it looks like we're right on top of the zero at this point. But in fact, if you zoom in, you notice that there's a little bit of error there. We're still not quite exactly at pi, so let's do this again. It turns out we're not going to exactly hit pi in this process, but we're going to do a good job of approximating pi. Well, let's take a look at the computations involved numerically that reflect what that graph just showed us. So first of all, we need to understand how we find equations for tangent lines to the graph of a function at a particular point. Now, you all learned this in your most recent unit, but let's, re let's review it right now so we have it for completeness. So remember that the general point-slope form of a line is given by y is the y-coordinate of the known point plus the slope times x minus the x-coordinate of the known point. Well, for us, the known point is x naught, the x coordinate where we start, and the y coordinate is the function at x naught. And the slope is the derivative at x naught. So for us, a tangent line is given by this equation. So now let's take a look at how we find where that tangent line hits zero. We start with the equation of the tangent line. Next. We ask ourselves on that line, what value of x gives y equal to zero? That tells us where the tangent line hits the x-axis. So we set the y equal to zero, write it over on this side, and we've indicated that we're really looking for the x-coordinate here. After this, all we're gonna do is unravel this equation for x and solve for x. So we move the f of x naught to the right to get negative f of x naught on the right. We divide through by f prime at x naught. But whenever we're dividing, remember that we have to make sure the thing we're dividing by is not zero. Finally, we add x naught to both sides and we have our solution. So what we've come upon here is this is the x value that for which the tangent line hits y equals zero. Okay, let's take a look at this in that graph again. We started with the graph of y equals sine of x. We started with x naught equaling two. We drew the tangent line at that point and we landed down here at another point. We're gonna call that point x sub one. And x1 is given by this formula involving the initial guess. Then remember what we did next was we repeated the process. Repeating the process means take the tangent line at this point, go up to the curve, ride the tangent line back down to the x-axis. So we're using the same formula we did originally, but now we do it with the input x1. 
we end up with X2, which is our second estimate. We repeat to find X3, and we repeat until we're exhausted, or we've got an estimate that's close enough to what we were looking for. So now let's go through this computation with the function f of x equals sine of x to approximate the value of pi. The first thing I want to remind you is the formula for Newton's method. We might call this the iterative formula for Newton's method. Let's substitute the function and its derivative in this ratio here, f of xn over f prime of xn. Well, f is the sine, so its derivative is the cosine. We put that in the denominator. Now we know a better expression for this is xn minus the tangent of xn. So what this equation tells us is if we have an estimate, the next estimate is given by this formula, the current estimate minus the tangent of that current estimate. Let's make a table of values and see where these estimates take us. So for n equals zero, in other words, our initial guess, we're starting at two. We're starting at x equal two. Our first estimate gives us somewhere around 4.2 when we run the first iteration of Newton's method. We estimate again, excuse me, we run the iteration again, and we get somewhere around 2.47, still not close. But once we get to our third estimate, we're finally in the threes. And watch what happens when we get to the fourth estimate. The fourth iteration already produces 3.14. So we've got accuracy to the first three digits for pi. The fifth estimate is extremely accurate. And the sixth, we're not going to do much better than that with this many decimal places uh, of accuracy available. So I'm exhausted with this one. I'm going to stop. And there's our estimate for pi using six iterations of Newton's method. Another example that we were interested in was the square root of two. So remember, to approximate the square root of two, what we're really after is approximating a zero of the function x squared minus two. If we write down the formula for the Newton iterates and we substitute our function x squared minus two and its derivative, 2x, we end up with this nice formula for the Newton iterates that the n plus first estimate is half of the current estimate plus the reciprocal of the current estimate. So let's take a look at the graph of x squared minus 2 near the square root of 2. We'll start with an initial estimate of 1, something very simple to work with. We ride the tangent line, we get our first estimate, 1.5. We ride the tangent line again, we have a pretty good estimate. In fact, up in the graph, it looks like we're very close to where the zero is. We keep on going and going, and notice something that happens here in the fourth and fifth estimates. What we see here is that, that our approximation didn't change. Now that can mean one of two things. That can mean that we've exactly hit the zero of our function x squared minus two, but we haven't. Or it could mean that we have reached the limit of the uh, accuracy that we can hit with this method with this many decimal places. So we're gonna stop the process when we see that there's no change because from here on out, there will be no change if I continue on down the road. So with four iterations of Newton's method, we have reached a really accurate approximation of the square root of two. Our final example, let's go back to the original problem that we started with. We had converted that to looking for a zero of the function x to the fourth minus three x cubed plus x squared plus two. Remember, this was what the graph of that function looks like near the point we're interested in, we are gonna to try to estimate the zero that's near x equal one. To do so, we need to figure out the formula for the Newton iterates in this case. So here's our function up above and here's our derivative, four x cubed minus nine x squared plus two x. We take the ratio of those two functions and I'm not gonna bother trying to simplify that at this point. We are going to run Newton's method with that formula 
for the Newton iterates. We're going to start with x n, excuse me, with x naught equaling one, and we'll follow along with the, uh, the iterates getting to be 1.33, 1.29. You can see that 1.29 is already fairly close to where the zero is. Let's keep on going and keep on going and keep on going until again, we see no change in the fifth and the sixth iterates. So within five iterations of Newton's method, we have a very accurate estimate of the zero of this polynomial. In other words, the solution to that original equation. Sometimes Newton's method can have some problems. So let's talk about what could go wrong in Newton's method. Let's take a look at the example that we just did, this fourth degree polynomial. Remember, we took the derivative and got 4x cubed minus 9x squared plus 2x. If we happen to plug in x equal 2 in that derivative, what we note is that f prime there is 0. That is a significant problem for Newton's method because we end up with a horizontal tangent line. Newton's method is all based on writing the tangent line to zero, but this tangent line never comes back to the x-axis. There was a part of Newton's method that divides by f prime at xn. We cannot divide by f prime of xn in this case. So this is one problem that could happen. You could either start at a bad position or end up at a bad position where there's a horizontal tangent line. In that case, Newton's method is going to fail. There are other things that could happen that actually are more interesting and they lead to some very interesting mathematics. Let's take a look at the sine function again. We estimated pi, the zero that happens right here, starting at x naught equal two. But what if we start just slightly to the left of two? There's a particular point here that something very interesting happens. First of all, when we run the first iterate, we land a little bigger than four, just like we did if we started at x naught equal two. But when we run the second iterate, we get right back to the original point where we were. This is a little bit of a problem for Newton's method because if we continue, we are just going to continue around this parallelogram. We are never going to make any progress on getting close to pi. These kinds of points are called periodic points. And for Newton's method with this function, these two x values would be called period two points because when you run two iterations of Newton's method, you get right back to the original point. While Newton's method is failing to find the zero that we're after, this is some interesting mathematics. And we might start asking ourselves some questions about, huh, I wonder if there are other ways that period points could show up or other interesting functions that have periodic points. This is an interesting function. It's the square root of x squared minus three in absolute value. Now we had to put the absolute value around the x squared minus three so that this function is defined for all real numbers. I'm gonna use that fact. I'm gonna be using x's that are less than the square root of three and x's that are larger than the square root of three. This function, as you can see from its graph, also has a period two point. The period two point would be right here. If we start with this initial estimate and we use Newton's method, in two steps, we return to that estimate. Now this point, which is part of that cycle, is also a period two point. What's interesting about this function is that there are more period two points. As we move that point to the left, our initial estimate, we see that all the points that we had in that interval were period two points. So this function is very interesting in that Newton's method fails in a very big way for all those initial estimates that we had just to the left of the zero that we were looking for. This function also has an issue in that it is non-differentiable. There's the point exactly that we're looking for where there isn't a tangent line. We might ask ourselves, are there points that are periodic of period other than two? And the answer to that question is, yes, there can be. Here's another 
interesting function. It is the absolute value of k minus k minus one over x all to the power one over k minus one, but I wanna use a particular value of the parameter k, 3.83. So just to say what this function really is, it is the one over 2.83 power of the absolute value of 3.83 minus 2.83 over x. Let's watch what happens when we start with an initial guess of just larger than 0.5. If we run Newton's method in three iterations, we return back to the initial estimate. That means that the three points on the x-axis are all period three points. Period three turns out to be sort of important in the, in the theoretical side of all of this. When you have a system that is produced through iteration like this, and you have a parameter that yields period three points, then other parameters can yield any periodic point that you want. In other words, points of any period that you want. You could have points of period 517 because you have a value of K where you have period three points. Let's take a look at that in just a minute. I wanna take a look at this function again, but now I'm not specifying the value of K. If we treat K like a fixed parameter, and we create the Newton iteration equation, we end up with this equation, that the n plus first estimate of the zero of this function is k times the nth estimate times one minus the nth estimate. This is a famous equation. This form is called a logistic equation. And if you are in BC calculus, or you go on to BC calculus, or you go to calculus two in college, you're gonna see the logistic differential equation, which has this same sort of form as this iterative equation does here for Newton's method. What's really neat about this equation is it gives us a relationship to chaos. We can look at the iterates of this logistic equation for various values of k. And when we do, we find this graph of periodic points. The points here, when k is less than about three, the points up on the graph are indicative of the x values that are fixed points for this equation. By fixed points, what we mean is if we take, for example, k equal 2.6, go up to the graph, we are at about 0.6. That means when xn is 0.6, xn plus one will also be 0.6. When we get up to about k equal three, we notice something interesting happens in this graph. We have what's called a bifurcation where things split in two. And at this point, we now have period two points. So for k equal 3.2, we have this value and that value go back and forth as period two points through iterating this equation. Continuing on, you see another bifurcation here and another bifurcation there and so on and so on. And right in this area, you'll notice there are what appears to be period three points and that's our K equal 3.83. There are other things that go on in Newton's method that can cause you some trouble. One of them is that Newton's method can be very sensitive to your initial guess. Let's take a look at the sine function. Let's start at x naught equal 1.67 and watch what happens with Newton's method. You'll notice that as we iterate in this case, we are nearing this point right here. Well, that turns out to be four pi. The Newton iterates are converging to four pi. If we start just slightly further to the right at 1.68, now the Newton iterates are converging to two pi. If we go to 1.69, it turns out the Newton iterates are converging to three pi. Now, remember, if we went all the way to two as our initial point, then the Newton iterates converge to pi. 
And when we started just a little to the left of two, the Newton iterates were periodic of period two. So you can see that where you start can have an impact on where you're going to end up in terms of which zero you're estimating, or even if you're gonna end up estimating a zero. The last thing I'll mention here is that Newton's method can be generalized to functions in the complex plane. If you go and study more mathematics in college, I recommend you take a course in complex analysis and you'll learn about Newton's method in the complex plane. It can, it, it can lead to these beautiful pictures called fractals. Finally, I recommend you try Newton's method yourself. Throughout this talk, you've seen many really beautiful graphs. They were developed in Desmos. The link on the screen is something that you should follow and go try Newton's method for yourself. I'd like to thank you and I wish you the best for the rest of the semester. And I hope that AP Calculus has treated you well and uh, that you do well on the exam this year. Take care, everybody.